I tried to kill myself when I was seven years old. Even at seven, I had been here long enough to know that I didn't want to be here. The kids were awful to each other at school. People were cruel to animals. There was suffering everywhere, and nobody was listening. Well, at seven years old, I had no idea how to kill myself. So after several failed attempts, I ran down to the garden that had always been my sanctuary. And it was a hummingbird that heard my cries. And it was a hummingbird that answered them. He flew within inches of my face for probably two minutes, but it felt like forever. And he hovered there with his cobalt blue and shimmering orange and fiery red his thumbing wings and his little tucked feet and his black beady eyes that looked into mine. And he noticed me and he beckoned me to stay and he saved my life. A feeling of peace and well-being came over me like everything was going to be okay. And that's where my love affair with animals really took off. I find myself needing to be with nature and animals every second that I could. And during my adventures and explorations of the woods and the lakes, it, I realized that sometimes animals need our help. I would find birds that fell out of their nest or turtles with broken shells. And I would bring them home and I came up with a dream to have a place full of animals that I saved and they would be my friends. Well, my poor parents didn't want a house full of animals. And they would send them away. And I was baffled. Why weren't they listening? Why didn't they care? Almost 20 years later, as a young adult living on my own, I discovered a petting zoo I'd never seen before. And I went in just to be nosy. And I found a lot of abuse and neglect there. But more horrifying than the overgrown toenails and the deformed legs, more horrifying than the beatings of the ponies and not one drop of water on that property was that the place was full of people and not one of them could see the suffering right in front of them. They were too busy holding hands and skipping around, smiling and taking pictures and posing their kids next to these dilapidated animals. And it broke my heart. So I started bringing them home to my little half acre backyard and healing them. And one day, months later, I looked out my little backyard to a, a my, I looked out my window to a backyard that was now full of animals and said, holy cow, I just started my dream. Well, that was 20 years ago. And the Gentle Barn is now a national nonprofit organization located in three different states where we take in animals that nobody else wants, rehabilitate them, give them sanctuary for the rest of their lives, and partner with them to connect children with nature and animals and heal people with the same stories of abuse and neglect. So I have lived in a barnyard for 20 years. And I have incredible stories of their friendships and their love affairs, of their personalities, their affection, and their intelligence. So today I want to tell you the story about Karma. Karma was, is a little itty bitty cow that we rescued from severe cruelty several years ago. She's a little itty bitty cow, red, with a white face, covered in freckles. She has fuzzy teddy bear ears and long eyelashes. And she came in with a few other cows from a severe cruelty case. And what was different about her than anyone else was that she kept crying. And we couldn't figure out why. All day long, incessantly pacing and crying, pacing and crying. But she had food, she had water, she had shelter, she had friends, and she passed the vet check. So what could possibly be wrong with her? Well, she cried all that first day and all that first night. And finally, in the wee hours of the following morning, I went down to figure out what she was trying to tell me. And I found it. She was dripping milk. What does that mean? She had a baby. So I called my husband, Jay, and said, she's crying because she has a baby. And he said, I'm on it. And through an amazing set of circumstances, my husband found the baby, navigated his release, and was able to bring him back to the gentle barn. Now, the baby never thought he was going to see his mom again. So when we let him out of the trailer and he rounded the corner and saw his mom again, he passed out at her feet. 
And she went over and very gently licked him and gently nudged him and made quiet, urging sounds to him. And he finally came to and found the strength to stand up. And then she gave him a bath until he was soaking wet. And when he nursed, she let out a big sigh of relief, and she has not made a sound since. Now that's where we thought the story would end, happily ever after, reunited together forever at the gentle barn. But eight months later, my staff came to me at the end of a long day, and they said that they were worried about karma because her udders were swollen. Does she have an infection? I asked. No, we think she's about to have another baby. And I said, but that's impossible. We just rescued her with a tiny nursing baby. Surely they wouldn't have impregnated her again so soon. And they said, well, just keep an eye out. Well, we have a ritual at the gentle barn for the last 20 years where before we go to bed, we check on the animals and make sure that they're okay. So that night, I tucked the piggies into bed with blankets. I counted the chickens and turkeys to make sure they were safely on their roosts. I gave, I gave kisses and cookies to the horses. And when I walked to the cow pasture, Karma was at the fence waiting for me. And I went up to her and I said, what's the matter, girl? What's going on? And she turned her body around and there was a foot sticking out of her. So I ran up to the house as fast as I possibly could and I said to my husband and children, wake up, we're having a baby! And we ran down to the cow pasture and when we got there, the 20 cows that we had at the time were all in a perfect circle around karma. So me and my husband and children took our place in the circle and we watched her labor and we watched her contract and we watched her push and we watched her give birth and we watched her clean him up and dry him off. We watched him struggle to stand and figure out how to walk and learn to nurse. This whole thing took two hours and not one of us moved. When he finally drank his fill and laid down to sleep off his birth, all 20 cows simultaneously broke the circle and formed a single file line in front of the baby. And nobody pushed and nobody shoved and nobody said, I'm here first. The matriarchs and elders took the front and the submissive younger cows took the back. And once the line was formed, the matriarch in the front went up to the baby and she licked him. And she welcomed him, and she introduced herself. And then she moved off, and the second in line welcomed him. And the third in line introduced herself, and the fourth and the fifth, until every cow in that family welcomed that baby. And when the cows were done, me, my husband, and my children took our turn, meeting the baby for the first time. And then we all sat down under the moonlight with smiles on our faces, and watched him sleep. And we realized that we were witness to something very sacred and very special that the real world doesn't get to see. Because in the real world, there is no family for animals. In the real world, animals fall in love and they're torn apart. In the real world, mommies don't get to raise their babies. Babies are taken away and they scream for each other on deaf ears. Well, we named him Surprise. <laughs> and every member of that family took a turn raising him. They all played with him. They all protected him. They all disciplined him. Every member of that family raised him. And he grew up to be a fine young man, cow. And karma was a little itty-bitty thing, but surprise grew to be 3,000 pounds and over seven feet tall. And by the time he was a year old, he had to lay down and roll upside down to nurse, and it was a little embarrassing. <laughs> and sometimes I would come up to her and say, karma, he's in college now, you can cut him off. But she would look at me with her sweet, wise face, and she would say, he's my last baby. I'm going to love him as long as I can. And she nursed him for five years. 
Well, Karma was so little and her sons were so big, they developed mobility issues and sadly she outlived both of them. But that same circle surrounded her when she was whispering in her son's ears that she loved them and it was okay to go. And they stayed by her side and mourned and grieved with her. Animals love their babies just like we do. They want to have families and community and friends just like we do. And they celebrate life and they mourn loss just like we do. Animals and the people that love them have always been my circle. Who's in your circle? Animals have always heard my cries. Who hears yours? And I have dedicated my life to hearing and answering the cries around me. Whose cries do you answer? I'm not suggesting that you all go home tonight and start bringing home cows. <laughs> Although if you did, you'd really like it. But I am suggesting that we are far more powerful as individuals than we know we are. And every single day, when we're shopping, and we're spending money, and we're going places, we are voting with our dollars to either support companies that harm and cause suffering to animals, that destroy this planet and make our bodies ill, or we're voting for companies and products that love animals and keep them safe, that have reverence for Mother Earth and the environment and that heal and nourish our bodies. And when we create families of our own, we are molding and forming the next generation to listen and to be kind and gentle and good. Instead of squishing bugs, we can teach our children to take them safely outside. Instead of chasing birds at the park, we can teach them to sit beside us and admire their beauty. And instead of picking flowers, we can teach our children to cherish their life. Because the cries we answer today can change the world. Thank you.